Have you ever felt like you just didn't measure up? Like no matter what you do, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you strive, how hard you work, how smart you are, how wise you are, you don't measure up. You can't win. You, over, you come up against an obstacle, a roadblock, a giant that you cannot defeat no matter how hard you try. I remember when I first moved out here. Now, I'm from Montana originally. So, and not like just, not urban Montana, if that's a thing. I'm from like rural Montana, like 20 miles in the mountains. That's where my family lives, and that's where they still live. And so when I first moved out here to be a teacher at Federal Way, in Federal Way school districts, I remember one of the hardest things it took me to get used to was the driving. <laughs> I'm still not used to it. And I remember um, one night I was visiting a friend. They lived in Tacoma. And so we, yeah, you already know where this is going. Uh, they lived in Tacoma. And so I went to visit them. We watched a movie. We played a game, whatever. And I remember getting in to the front seat of my 2000 Subaru Outback Maroon classic car. <laughs> getting behind the, the steering wheel. And I knew... All I had to do to get back home to Federal Way was get onto I-5 and go north. <laughs> but we all know it is not that easy. <laughs> I struggled, so I, I, I went, okay, I'm following my GPS because I'm horribly directionally challenged. I, I like rely on my GPS, it's a crutch for me. And so I'm following my GPS and it's leading me to the on-ramp to go onto I-5 to finally make it home traffic cones and I turn around I circle around okay I'm gonna try again traffic cones I was stuck in Tacoma going in circles in circles in circles for two and a half hours two and a half have you ever been driving for two and a half hours and you have no idea where you even are it was it was horrible, and the worst part is, is that every time I went back to that on-ramp, because the GPS, because it didn't account for whatever construction has been going on there for like a million years, when will it end? <laughs> the GPS led me back to the foot of that sign, that Emerald Queen Casino sign, 300 feet tall, and I looked up at it, and I was defeated. I knew I'd lost again. It didn't matter. I could turn right. I could turn left. I could fly. I would always end up at the foot of the Emerald Queen Casino sign. <laughs> and I know that some of you have faced similar situations. Maybe not that extreme. That was a big thing. But I know that some of you have come up against an obstacle, come up against a roadblock, come up against a giant that you just, of your own power, of your own accord, you could not win. And that is the situation that the Israelites found themselves in, in our text today. So if you could turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, or open it up on your phone, and um, while you're turning there, our children's ministry director, Tori, is going to come around and pass out some sticker sheets to all of the kids in the audience so you have something to fiddle with during the service. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 17. All right, so a little bit of background information. So last week, Pastor Garen was talking about how the Israelites, after they had been delivered from the land of Egypt, they were brought out of slavery. The Lord appointed these people called judges over them. And these were, well, they're literally judges. They're people who would stand before the people. They would lead the people, and they would help them with their sin. They would help them against other armies. They, would just, they were the leaders of the country. However, as time went on, as time progressed, the Israelites, as you know by now, tended to do, they started to complain to God and to the judges. Why do we need a judge? We're the only, I've never even heard of a judge. Who's led by a judge? Judges in the Supreme Court. That doesn't even make any sense. We want a king. 
And so God, in his grace, in his mercy, even though he knew it was not what was best for Israel, he said, fine, I will give you a king. And so he anoints a ruler. His name was Saul. And that's where our story picks up today. Israel is under the rulership, under the kingdom of Saul. And here's what's happening. So Israel, Israel is at war with this group of people, this group of vicious marauders. They're basically pirates, seafaring voyagers who would come into other lands and take land, trying to expand, get bigger, get bigger, get bigger, grow. They were called the Philistines. And so Saul is at war with them. We cannot lose this land. This is our promised land. We cannot hand this over to these barbarians. And so the Philistines camp on top of one hill in Israel, top of this big hill. And Saul goes to meet them. He's camped on the opposite hill with a valley in between, kind of like the Valley of Auburn with the two hills on each side. <laughs> And they went down, so Israel, the Philistines, went down their opposing hills, and they met each other one morning. And this is what happened. Verse 8. Actually, verse 4, sorry. So out of the Philistine army, out of the Philistine camp, thank you, Pastor Garen, comes this giant. This huge, enormous man. It says that he was over nine feet tall. And so, because I think, like, you know, we think of nine feet tall, it doesn't seem that big to us. Because, you know, okay, like a, a, a fairly average guy is like a little less than six foot tall. Did he fall over? <laughs> okay. A little less than six feet tall. So, okay, yeah, six, seven, eight, nine. That's not that big. He is 50% taller than a normal man. He is huge. It was a lot of effort to even get this thing to stand. Even now it's barely standing because I could barely reach it. And I'm a little afraid of what's going to happen after the service, and we'll find out what happens. So he's this huge man, and he's not just big size-wise, nine and a half feet, that's big. He's not just big size-wise. He is better equipped than all of the Israelites. It says he was wearing armor that was 125 pounds. Some of you don't even weigh 125 pounds. But he wore this huge bra bra uh, copper, brass, uh, chain mail. And he carried three weapons. He had a giant spear. He had a sword. And he had a javelin attached to his back. This man was a walking tank. <laughs> and when the Israelites came up to him, they stood on the, in the valley, they looked up at Goliath, and they ran in fear. They were terrified at this monster of a man. In fact, in verse 8, it says, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. And he says, why are you all coming out to fight? I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. You are nothing. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. One-on-one -on -one ba battle, mano o oh mano. If he kills me, we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, and you know I will, you will be our, sl our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And it says, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken, down to their bones, could not stand. They could only run. And can you blame them? He's nine and a half feet tall. 125-pound armor, three weapons. The Israelites didn't even have metal weapons. It says back in 1 Samuel 13, because the Philistines, they were the ones who were the blacksmiths. They were the ones who could make weapons. And they had a rule in Philistia, where the Philistines came from, you were not allowed to equip an Israelite. The only two swords in all of Israel belonged to the king, Saul, and the prince, Jonathan, 
the Israelites didn't have any weapons. They had bows and arrows, maybe sharpened sticks, maybe with a stone on it. They were horribly unequipped for this challenge. And so they see this guy and they run away. And you can't even blame them, right? Because we've all been there. We've all faced challenges, faced obstacles in our life where it's like nothing we can do. I am too small for this. This is too big for me. I can't win. Some of you are dealing with the loss of a job because of COVID, where you go to interview after interview. Maybe you're not even getting the interviews you apply for. And no matter what you do, no matter how much you pound the pavement every single day, you can't find a job to to provide for your family, to put food on your table. Some of you are struggling with abusive relationships where they mistreated you over and over and over again, and you feel like you're trapped. You can't do anything to overcome this. Or maybe you're struggling with sin, a sin that you know is wrong, a sin that you come across every single day, and though you read your Bible, you pray, you try and counter it, you fall back into it over and over again, even though it kills you to your very core to do it again. We have all been there. We have all faced that giant. And I'll tell you something, this continued for 40 days. 40 days! They would get on their opposing hills, the Philistines, the Israelites. Maybe the Israelites woke up with an ounce more courage this morning. Okay, maybe we can defeat the Philistines today. They go down into the valley and they see him. And he gives the same taunt he's been giving for the past days, the past weeks, the past month now. And you run away. Forty days. Can you imagine the emotional, the spiritual trauma these people must have been facing to face the same problem for 40 days and have no idea what to do? It's like when I'm driving around Tacoma and I see that sign again. It's like, I'm never, I'm going to be trapped here forever. Like this, I'm in like some parallel universe that loops. Forever. (laughs) It would be overwhelming. And then, you know what's coming. Out of the wilderness comes a young shepherd boy named David. David, 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 David. (laughs) So David is just a young, it says he's a ruddy-faced boy, dirty, you know, he's like playing in the mud all day. And he's delivering food to his brothers who are actually, you know, old enough to be soldiers in Saul's army. David is not. David is just a young boy. He comes up to the camp, and David hears Goliath's taunt. He sees, and he sees Israel's army, the army of the Lord, he sees his brothers, his three big brothers who he looks up to, run in terror from the Philistine, from this giant man of war. And he hears in verse 25, chapter 17, verse 25, he hears the men of Israel say, have you seen the giant? He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him, but who can? He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. And can you just see David's ears perking up at this point? He's like, wait, what? The man who defeats him gets to not only marry a princess— but he gets to avoid taxes for his entire life? I would do a lot to avoid taxes for a year. The IRS, if they heard that, I I always pay my taxes. (laughs) Always. But David hears that, and then, this is my favorite part. Verse 26, he says, And who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed 
that you are letting him defy the armies of the living God. We have the only God in the universe who stands at our back. Why do you look at this giant and say we cannot beat him? His gods are fake. Our God is real. Can you see the difference? The difference in perspective that David has here. And so Saul the king hears of David's question, hears of David, the gall this kid has, and he summons him to his tent. And so let's turn to verse 32. It was so hard picking the verses to read and put on the screen because they're all so good. You should read that later. And David says to Saul, the king, who's been a man of war for like years, and says, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. And Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted, and he says, I have been taking taking care of my father's sheep, he's a shepherd, and his goats, so a a goatard. (laughs) And he says, when a lion or a bear comes to steal the lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. And if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. Yeah, wow, seriously. I have done this to both lions and I have done this to bears and I will do it to this pagan Philistine too. And pay attention to this next part because this is the sentence upon which this story hangs. He says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the bear will save me from this Philistine. He will save me. He will save me. And yes, David, so David has to stand before Saul and he has to convince Saul because they have one shot. They only got one shot, one chance to beat the Philistines. Because if you lose to Goliath, we all become their slaves. One shot. He has to convince Saul that I'm a, little, I'm a boy. Let me go out and fight him. So yes, he's, he's giving this. He's giving a convincing argument. I have done this. I killed the lion. I killed the bear. But you have to notice where he directs the source of his victory. And it is not the hands of David. It is the God of armies. The God of the world David's God. He is the source of his victory, and that is why he can face Goliath with confidence. Confidence. Because he knows that though David doesn't measure up, God does, and God will give him victory. And this is my favorite part. (laughs) So David goes to meet Goliath, man of war, with only a staff, a shepherd's staff, a sling, and five round smooth stones. And then this happens. Verse 32, oh wait, verse 41. Goliath sees David, and Goliath's mad. Can you imagine, like, you're a, you're a soldier, a trained man of war, and you see a middle schooler, a high schooler come up before you to oppose you, you would be furious. How dare you insult me this way? He stands before David. Verse 41 says, Goliath walked out toward David. Oh, I forgot about this. With his shield bearer in front of him. In front of Goliath, not only does he has huge armor, huge weapons, he has a man who stands in front of him with a SWAT riot shield and protects him from any oncoming blows. One-on-one, I'm not sure how this works. So he's got his shield bearer in front of him. And he's sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. He says, am I a dog? He roars. That you would come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods and says, come over here and I will give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. And David stood his ground and replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, 
with spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. For this is the Lord's battle. Not David's battle. Not Goliath's battle. But the battle belongs to the Lord. And he will give you to us. And so David stands before Goliath. Goliath's over here, and Goliath is fuming mad. And he comes toward David, and he goes, goosh, 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 pulls out his spear, but David's ready. He drops the stick in his hand, takes his sling, and he starts booking it. Running in circles around Goliath, round and around and around, like I was in Tacoma. Round and around and around. He's trying to get behind that shield there, behind that riot shield. And Goliath is turning as David's spinning around him. He can't keep up. He can't keep up. And he looks. He looks to try. He's got behind him. And David lets loose. And it connects. The single stone flung from the sling sinks right into the Philistine champion's head. And it digs in. And the giant falls. Boom! Down. One hit. Shortest battle in all of biblical history. That's all it took to defeat the Philistine champion, Goliath. Goliath, the nine-foot-tall man. And do you know why David was victorious? It was not because he killed the lion. It was not because he killed the bear. It was not because, as some have said, he spent all of his youth slinging stones at rocks, at sheep, at other animals because he was bored in the field and had nothing better to do. The reason that David won that day against the giant was because he placed his confidence in the Lord. He knew that even though I, David, do not measure up to this problem, God does. God does. And the Lord does not lose. Ever. The Lord does not lose ever. And so you may be facing a problem in your life that is too big for you. A problem where it's like, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you just can't win. You just can't win. Some of you are struggling with depression, with anxiety, where you feel like you go throughout the day and it's a struggle to just roll out of the bed in the morning. And you feel like you're trapped in this shell of a body that's yours and you cannot escape. Some of you have struggled with abusive relationships. Some of you have struggled with drug addiction, with alcohol addiction, with any kind of sin addiction, and you feel like you cannot gain victory over it. And I stand before you today and I promise you, with the God of victory on your side, you will be given victory over it. That is a promise. That is a promise. Now your victory, it may look like David's. Your victory may be instantaneous. One sling of the sling, done. And there are people who have been delivered from horrible circumstances, from depression, from sin. I remember my pastor back at my old church, he was, a, he was a strung out druggie on the streets. Came to Jesus and instantaneously the Lord cured him of all desire for drugs. 
instantly. The Lord does that, and that is why it is so important that we pray for one another, because the Lord does bring that kind of healing. The Lord does bring that kind of victory instantaneously. But there are some of you who are going through long, drawn-out battles, battles where you've prayed, and you've sought the Lord, and you've sought help from doctors and everyone else, and you still can't find that victory. You have been promised, if you place your faith in the God of armies, if you place your faith in the God who does not lose, you will be given victory in this life or in the next. Because in the next life, you will find that freedom. There will be no sickness. There will be no challenges. There will be no death in the next life. And so I ask you guys, if, is there anyone out there who's struggling with something, who's facing this obstacle that you cannot overcome on your own, no matter how hard you try? Would you raise your hand? Because I would love to pray for you right now. And my hand is, is raised. This is not a demonstration because I struggle too. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are not a losing God. And Lord, we hand over our trials, we hand over our problems, we hand over our illnesses, our depression, our abusive relationships to you. And God, we pray for victory because we know the battle belongs to you. So Lord, we ask for victory in your name. And Lord Jesus, if it is in your plan, and we know that your ways are higher than our ways, if it is in your plan to not be delivered right away, God, Father, I pray for comfort in all of the hearts of these people, in all of the hearts of these children you have gathered here today because you have said that everything, you work everything together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. You work all things for good. We ask these things in your name. Amen. You can put your hands down. And maybe, maybe you don't know Jesus yet. Maybe you don't have a relationship with the God of victory. Maybe you don't have a relationship with the God who never loses. Can I invite you today to place your faith in Jesus? Place your faith in in the God who always wins, the God who will bring you victory over whatever you are going through. And so I'm going to invite you to pray with me, and everyone around you will be praying too, so you don't feel called out. But would you just follow along with me in this moment? Would you just follow this prayer? If you want to live that kind of victorious life, pray with me, please. Dear Jesus, and repeat after me, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have fallen short of your glory. And I turn from my sins. And I embrace you, Jesus, for you are the God of victory. And you triumphed over my sins when you died on the cross for me. And so, Jesus, I give my heart over to you. I surrender to you. And I ask that you would make me your apprentice. That you would lead me. That you would guide me all the days of my life. And if you prayed that prayer, Oh, sorry. Amen. <laughs> and if you prayed that prayer, you have assurance. You have certainty. You have the confidence of David standing before the giant that on that day, when you stand before God, you will be counted righteous. You will be counted blessed. And the Lord will welcome you into his arms. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
today. Man, what an encouraging word, definitely. I, I love that you said, in the context of the story, though David doesn't measure up, God does. And that's very easy to apply to our lives. Though I don't measure up to this thing, this battle, God does. And I love that he said, and God has our back. God has your back. Amen? Amen. We believe that. Amen. Uh, uh, Tori, why don't you come on up here? Uh, Tori, our, our children's ministries director, and tell us what's coming after the service for the kids. Hi. Um, if we haven't met yet, I'm Tori, like Pastor Garen said. I'm the children's ministry director. And today, following the service, we have something really excited planned for the kids. Um, you guys see our Goliath giant right here. Well, we actually, Joseph, my husband, made slings for all of the kids, so you guys get to actually use a sling and try to knock down Goliath, which is so cool. So I wanna invite all of the kids after service. We have taped lines on the floor so that we're socially distanced and we're safe, but we can still have an amazing time. So you guys can take your sling, try to knock down Goliath, and the coolest part is, just for participating, you win a prize. So that's super <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that so is. I wanna see all of you guys out there, and I'm gonna head out there right now. Awesome, we'll see you there. It has been good to be together today. If, if at the end of the message, you prayed that prayer with Pastor Christian and you put your faith in Jesus, I wanna encourage you, whether you're in the room or online, to, to head to the website, head to our website, and just let us know. Fill out a Connect card, and there's a, there's a box there you can check that says, I made that decision to put my faith in Jesus today. So let me know. I, I really want to know with you and celebrate with you. The, uh, if you have kids right here or uh, watching online, we have Kids Church Online. So after all the fun in the lobby today, kids go home and, and uh, get cool in, indoors and watch Kids Church Online. If you're watching online, it's, it's part of our YouTube channel. Just head on over to Kids Church Online and be a part of that today. Uh, we will be right back here next week uh, in uh, gathering together and online. So I hope to see you then. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for being here today. See you next week.